Thanks for tuning in to Witch Wednesdays with Steph for a chat about a new witchcraft topic every Wednesday morning. Welcome back to Witch Wednesdays. I'm Steph and you are listening to episode 94, Broomsticks in Witchcraft. Broomsticks are one of the traditional images of witchcraft that really sticks out, especially this time of year. Every Halloween shop has at least one item that features a witch flying on a broomstick. They really are one of the most iconic symbols associated with witches, witchcraft, Wicca, the occult, and paganism in general. They appear not only in these commercial and pop culture representations, but are also pervasive in mythology and history. So today we are going to discuss brooms and what they're actually used for in modern witchcraft. So the first question, of course, is what is a broomstick? In witchcraft, it is traditionally referred to as a besom, B-E-S-O-M. So if you are looking, studying witchcraft in general, but looking in stores because you might want to buy one if you're looking up how to make one, they are usually called besoms. So that's what they appear as in texts and books. So if you've come across that word before, that's what it's referring to. It is a bundle of twigs tied to one long stave of wood. The type of wood of this long stick has varied over the years, but the Name broomstick originates from the first bristles that were used to be tied at the bottom, and that was called broom. It is a woody, fibrous plant that actually still grows today. So it was a very literal word, these twigs of broom tied to a stick, broom stick. They were not very creative in naming that one. Broom isn't used so much today, even though the plant still exists. So today, besoms can be found in all types of material. Ash, birch, and willow are the most popular, but you can also make mini besoms uh, that are very popular as an altar tool. And those are often made out of sage or lavender. They can be simple, ornate, large, small. There are really no rules regarding the appearance or the type of materials that they are made out of. But before we get into what these more modern besoms are used for in the practice of witchcraft, let's first look at why in history are broomsticks associated with witches flying. And really the stories all stem from the besom being rooted in a lot of folklore and mythology. It starts back with the fact that broomsticks were commonly found in homes in the Middle Ages, since that was the only tool, really, that they had for cleaning back then. And they were used solely by women. But despite this association with women, the first known case of claiming to have flown on a broomstick was actually confessed by a French male witch, Guillaume Adeline. I don't speak French, that could be wrong pronunciation, sorry about that. It back in 1453, although there are prior records of witches flying on sticks or poles or similar objects that people have reported. And there are French and German illustrations from as early as the 15th century that show witches flying around on broomsticks or sometimes pitchforks. Specifically, warlocks, which were the male equivalent of witches back then, were historically described as riding pitchforks instead of broomsticks like witches. But we, of course know that flying on a broomstick is not possible. There are a lot of things that you can do with witchcraft that can help you, but we know, and if you listened to uh, last season, the beginner misconceptions, witchcraft is still bound by the physical laws of this plane. So you cannot do things with witchcraft that are not possible within the realm of physics, and flying on a broomstick is one of those things. I know that Harry Potter makes it look like a lot of fun, but yes, being able to fly without the aid of, you know, an airplane (laughs) or uh, changing your height or eye color or shooting fire from your fingertips, all of those things are not possible because witchcraft cannot break the laws of physics as we currently know them. So since we know this, why then are there so many historical reports of witches being seen 
flying on broomsticks or reporting that they themselves flew on broomsticks. Of course, we know that witches themselves reported flying on broomsticks because most of the quote-unquote witches who these reports came from were tortured and ultimately killed. But I think we are all familiar with the you know knowledge that torture doesn't work um, for any reason, that people who are tortured are going to tell you whatever it is that you want to hear. And that this was common mythology that was floating around and lots of stories and images that they have seen. So they are just telling their torturers what they want to hear. And a lot of those people who were accused of being witches, a lot of those women, were never actually witches in the first place. So those self-reported histories were not actually them flying on broomsticks in the traditional sense. But still people reported seeing people flying on broomsticks. And what this really was, was just a complete miscommunication. In fact, in the Middle Ages, witches would prepare what was called a flying ointment. It was also known as a green ointment to aid them in their journey. And the, I say journey because it was like astral projection, because the recipes for these flying ointments, which often did have actual flies in them, had a base of either belladonna, which is called nightshade, or mandrake, also known as mandragora, she says in her best Hermione Granger voice, both of which are highly psychoactive drugs <laughs> that produce visions and it could eventually kill you, but before they do, um, they sort of produce these visions, encourage astral projection, and they would mix this with clove oil, which is known for its anesthetic properties. So actually, the generally accepted theory about the origins of witches flying on brooms is based on this ritual involving this psychoactive drug trip. The ointment was rubbed all over the body, usually using the broom, particularly on the forehead, wrists, hands, feet, under the arm, or between the legs, and it gave a sensation of flying. The witches would then mount the broomsticks and would leap around in the fields, smeared with the flying ointment, to teach the crops how to grow high. And the ointment would give them imaginary trips of feeling like they've flown distances. So that's sort of where this whole miscommunication comes from. They might have reported flying because while they were on their psychedelic trip, they thought that they were flying. And because other people would see them jumping around in the fields and jumping over the hedgerows. And it seemed like, you know, from across the field that they were flying, but in fact, they were just jumping up and down, teaching the crops how to grow. This association with witches, broomsticks, and flight was further solidified by the mythology surrounding Baba Yaga. Baba Yaga is one of the most feared yet most respected witches found in Slavic and Russian folklore. She's very well known and is said to hold goddess attributes and power over the elements of, you know, earth, fire, water, and air, but is considered a witch. So as she flies through the air, she wields a pestle in one hand and a broom to sweep the path behind her in the other. And crows and owls fly by her side and she appears as a crone and has uh, been said to eat children, but also acts as a spiritual guide to those who are courageous enough to ask her for the correct way to go. She's also said to guard the doorway to the other world and control the passage of the dead back and forth across its borders. So that was another very well-known witch in the times who was specifically associated with flying and a broomstick. So that really solidified the idea that it was a witch's tool. I also wanted to share some of the folklore surrounding broomsticks that come from cultures all over the world, signifying that broomsticks have had a magical use throughout history um, and throughout all of these different cultures. So first, a common one among many cultures is that if your broomstick falls over, particularly one that you keep near the door, uh, it means that company is coming. I mentioned the broomstick jumping, but jumping over a broom signified marital union as well in the Old South, which was a custom derived directly from slave culture. And that's partially because of the magical significance of the broomstick within African tribes. 
and partially due to the lack of any other resources afforded to the slaves during that time. Uh, they were not allowed to access anything, but they did have the broomsticks. So that is part of the way that they brought their culture with them and made do with what was available to them. Another uh, superstition associated with broomsticks is to never sweep under someone's feet. It causes bad luck. And speaking of bad luck, a invisible broom, whatever that might be, <laughs> was said to be removed from the house of Sarah Good, according to the testimony of William Batten and William Shaw during the Salem witch trials. A witch's broom is also used to summon winds for weather magic. Uh, history says that throwing a broom into the air off a cliff summons the wind, while burning one stops the wind. And there is specifically a Chinese broom goddess who presides over the weather, and her name is Cao Ching Niang. The straws of a broom are thought to have magical powers, so they are often used in healing spells. And there is also a myth that says jumping over a broomstick nine times will bring a su suitable spouse within one year. I don't know of anyone who has tried that, but give it a whirl and let me know. Laying a broomstick across the threshold ensures that only good visitors come by. And in Appalachian old traditions, it's said that it would keep witches out. But we know that's not true. <laughs> uh, but also in Appalachian folklore, it says that if a girl steps over a broom by accident, that she will become a mother before she becomes a wife. And lastly, uh, some African tribes believe that men should leave the house while women are sweeping because if they are accidentally struck by the broom, it could render them impotent unless they take the broom and bang it on the wall three times. So as you can see, folklore uh, across different cultures, across centuries, so it has always had this sort of magical place. So, of course, after history and folklore, the next natural question is what are besoms used for now, since they are still a popular part of witchcraft practice? How are witches using them? So the most common way that they are used in witchcraft today is for sweeping out negativity. Broomsticks are a physical remover. So we talked about the home cleansing episode and we talked about smoke cleansing and ritual waters that those things are both spiritual cleansers so those spiritually cleanse out the air and cleanse out that negativity whereas a besom is an actual physical remover you are actually making that sweeping motion to physically remove the negative energy and it, it works in the same way that we talked about in the cleansing episode where you do the sweeping motion from the top to the bottom of your house and from the back to the front. So top to bottom and then back and out the front door to get rid of all of the negativity. And unlike a regular broomstick used for actual cleaning in the house, this is not meant for the bristles to hit the floor. It is more of a ceremonial broomstick. So it's generally kept a few inches off of the floor. Some people will use a traditional broomstick and actually do the cleaning and the sweeping motion and hit the floor with the bristles as they go out. But then when they sweep inwards to bring in positivity and luck, they then keep the bristles off of the floor as they sweep inwards. So it's all personal preference and what type of um, besom that you have because a traditional broomstick that is used for cleaning is made differently with different materials and looks a lot different from the more ceremonial ones that tend to be a little fancier and made of materials that would get damaged if they do hit the floor. And the mini besoms can be used in the same way on an altar space where you do that sweeping motion above your altar before you get started with any ritual to sweep away any negative or stagnant energy. And both kinds, whether a regular size or a mini besom, are often used before casting a circle to cleanse the space before um, you cast a protective energy around it. Which brings me to the second point of what besoms are used for, which is protection. When placed bristles up at or near a door, they act as protection for the home by stopping negative spirits or entities from passing through, which is part of the reason that we see them 
more often at this time of year because uh, they are a popular tool during Samhain and Beltane when the veil is the thinnest and spirits are more easily crossing back and forth and communicating with us, that having that protection of the bristles facing up broomstick at the door means that any sort of negative spirits won't be coming through. It's also said that when it is laid flat under a bed or a mini besom is kept under a pillow, it can act as protection for the sleeper during the night because that is when we are at our most vulnerable. In the Wiccan tradition, a modern besom is generally made of ash or hazel for the handle with birch twigs as the bristles that are all then tied together using thin pieces of willow wood, which are all traditional and sacred woods within the Wiccan religion. And again, it's believed to purify and protect and to ritually cleanse a circle casting area before any magic is performed. So in a Wiccan coven, then a high priestess or high priest walks clockwise, tracing the ritual circle and sweeping with the broom, again, usually a few inches off the ground. For Wiccans, it represents both masculine and feminine, so it represents the duality of their religion. And this means it's often used in ceremonies celebrating this duality, specifically like hand fastings. And of course, at the end of the ceremony, the couple will jump over the broom, which represents the passage from single life into married life. And the besom there is also a symbol of fertility to ensure that the married couple will have children. So two other uses for besoms in modern day practice really have to sort of tie together. And that is that they are associated with the fae and also with doorways. And fae themselves are also associated with doorways because doorways are sort of are considered that in-between space, which is the realm of the fae as well, that in-between space. So besoms often act as a doorway when you are casting a circle. So that can allow you to um, come and go from the circle without breaking it, without having to um, bring down that energy and then raise it up again every time that you need to make the circle. You can just have a besom in one spot that will act as a doorway. It also can assist spirits traveling from one plane to the next, again, acting as a doorway. And it can be used to um, help work with the Fae and contact the Fae as uh, a physical representation of crossing between those two worlds. So as you can see, a lot of very useful reasons to keep a besom around, different ways that it can be used in your practice. I personally do have one um, that just stays out as decor, and I have one that I use in that um, like ritual, ceremonial, off the floor cleaning, uh, and then I usually get some sort of uh, cinnamon broom that they sell this time of year. Uh, you could get them literally anywhere, dollar store, Home Depot, all kinds of places, uh, just because they smell really good. And I like to put those out both as decor and then it makes my front porch smell really good. Plus um, I know that it is protection and witchy related. So lots of good reasons to have them and have them in different sizes. But of course, personal preference, if none of those things sound interesting to you or that they would be useful to you in your practice, it's definitely not necessary to have one. You can absolutely buy them if you want to. There is, there's some, you know, ideas out there <laughs> that you can't buy your own tarot decks, or at least not your first one. And I definitely don't believe in that. I talked about that in the um, unpopular witchy opinions in case you missed that episode. So just so you know, I said that in there that I don't agree with that fact. I think that you can buy your own tarot deck if you want to. And there are no um, superstitions like that surrounding the broomstick. So you can buy your own besom if you want to. There are lots of great ones on Etsy that are handmade and beautiful. So absolutely great options there. But if you want to make them, I have one method of making and blessing your besom in a ceremony over on Patreon. I put that up, I think, last year, actually. So that's been up for a while. And I will also have a visual guide of what I'm about to explain over at Patreon and at whichwednesdays.com so you can see what I'm talking about because it's just a little easier 
Um, I am going to talk you through it step by step of how to make one. But again, for visual learners, it's just easier to see the picture and see what I'm talking about. But if instead you want to make your own besom, that is also an option. I mentioned what the traditional Wiccan besom looks like, but you can choose to make yours out of a lot of different materials and often witches choose based on what is available to them in their natural area from you know fallen tree branches and things like that. But you can specifically pick a type of wood based on its properties. So I will mention a few of the most popular ones and a little bit about what they are associated with in case you want to find one of these to source for your besom making. Ash is for protection, prosperity, and health. Birch is for protection, binding, and purification. Dogwood is for wishes and protection. Elder is for binding, protection, and healing, though this wood is more often used for wands. Oak is for protection, health, money, and healing, and is a tree sacred to the Druids. Pine is for healing, protection, binding, and money. And Rowan is for psychic powers, healing, power, success, and protection. And when it comes to the materials to make the bristles, I usually recommend straw if you're going to be making it yourself because it can be easily obtained and it's sort of the easiest and most pliable to work with without also shedding all over the place. And a benefit of straw is that it can be dyed using herbal dyes so you can make it a bunch of different colors. If you want to dye it black, you would use alder, black walnut, or yarrow. For blue, you would use elder, indigo, wood, or Oregon grape. For brown, you would use comfrey, fennel, hops, onion, or pokeweed. For gold, you would use dock, goldenrod, and safflower. And for green, you could use barberry, bayberry, or sage. And don't worry, all of those will be linked in the show notes on whichwednesdays.com so you can run through that list again if you are interested in making your own. What you are going to need is a three to four foot long piece for the handle of your chosen wood. And then you're going to need your straw or thinner branches of birch for the bristle part, especially if you are going the more traditional Wiccan root. You'll need about three feet of willow branch in order to bind the twigs or straw, or if you choose herbs, to the wooden handle. Scissors, a bucket of warm water to soak the straw, twigs, branches overnight, and anything you want to decorate. So flowers or ribbons, charms, totally optional. What you're going to want to do is line up the bristles along the handle about four inches from the bottom. Point the bottom of the bristles towards the top of the broom because you're going to be flipping the bristles later again. I feel like this is easier to visualize, so the picture will be up on the website. Use the willow branches or a cord to wrap the straw tightly around the broom handle and tie it off. And then you take the straw or bristles and fold them down over the willow binding so that they're pointing towards the bottom of the broom and tie them down again at the base of the broomstick to secure them. And as you work, visualize your intention for creating the besom. You want to let it dry for 48 hours and then consecrate it as you would any other one of your magical tools, whether that is using water or moonlight, however you usually do that. So in theory, it's only four steps and a pretty easy process, but if you're not a very crafty person or if you are a real perfectionist, and are going to be bothered by imperfections in the outcome, you may prefer to just buy one instead. I personally have bought all of mine, and when I get a little cinnamon broom each season, I buy that as well because I just don't have that particular crafty gene. There are other crafty sort of things that I can do, but that is not one of them, and I do have that perfectionist tendency where I want it to look a certain way, and if it doesn't turn out that way, I won't be happy with it. So. I have bought all of mine. So absolutely 
no shame in that either. But I know a lot of witches love to craft it themselves and get really hands-on with that because they feel so much more connected to it that way. Absolute personal preference and totally up to you. But that is everything that I have this week that I wanted to share on besoms from history and folklore up to modern uses and how to make one for yourself. So hopefully that clears up some of the confusion around flying witches. But if you have any questions, let me know in the comments and head over to the website or to Patreon again to look at those show notes. And I will link a couple of places where um, I know have really great besoms if you are looking to purchase one. That is all I have for you this week. I will see you next week. This podcast was made using the free platform Anchor. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Now you can even add any song from Spotify directly to your episodes. The possibilities are endless for what you can create, whether it's music analysis, your own radio show, or something the world's never heard before. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership, and it's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Need even more witchcraft? Subscribe to Patreon for exclusive bonus content three times a week and order Sabbat boxes and other supplies at witchwednesdays.com. Be sure to follow on Instagram at Witch Wednesdays Podcast.